Hello and welcome back to section 7 of the course where we will study some examples from the industry in which companies have used the microservices architecture in a successful way. In this section we will focus our study mainly on two examples. Our first example will be Netflix which started as a company renting and selling DVDs and then evolved into a video streaming company. Our second example will be Gilt, an online shopping website. For our examples, we'll be mainly referring to public information. We'll also provide references to the original sources wherever possible so that you can study more on your own if you want to. In our first example, we will look at why Netflix decided to use a microservices architecture, what are some of the approaches they've used and some lessons they've learned during this evolution. It all started in August of 2008 when Netflix had a very big outage because of a major database corruption which prevented them from being able to ship DVDs to customers for three whole days. This incident made them realize that they had to move away from single point of failures that could only scale vertically and move to components that can scale horizontally and can be highly available. They also decided to abandon their private data centers and migrate to the public cloud, AWS specifically, which could provide this horizontal scalability. Of course, in order to eliminate all the existing single point of failures, they decided to re-architect their systems instead of just moving them as is to the cloud. Fast forward seven years and Netflix had completed their migration to AWS. During these years, the company has achieved tremendous growth, up to three orders of magnitude, and the adoption of the public cloud and a microservices architecture were the main drivers of this growth. The elasticity of the cloud allowed them to expand to new regions very easily without a lot of additional work required. It also allowed them to have very high levels of availability since they were able to build highly reliable systems out of unreliable but redundant components, such as using multiple regions in AWS. Even though cost reduction was not the main driver of this movement, they have acknowledged that they were able to save a lot of money using techniques such as autoscaling. This is a high-level diagram of the Netflix architecture in the early days. It consisted of a monolith which contained all the business logic and communicated with an Oracle database which was connected with another database responsible for billing using a technique known as dblink. All of that was fronted by a load balancer. The main problems of this architecture is that all of the teams were deploying various Java components in this monolith, being unaware of functionality existing from other teams, thus making the maintenance of the code harder every time. On top of that, if there was a bug in the changes for a single component, that could potentially take down the whole monolith, leading to an outage. Of course, the same was true for the data store. Everything was stored in a single database, which means that if there was a problem with changes on a specific table, that could affect the whole system. At this point, Netflix was mainly available in web browsers, but they needed to expand to many other devices, which could not be achieved easily with this architecture, since the monolith was responsible for both the business logic and the presentation logic. As a result, they decided to re-architect their system. They started splitting some services out of the monolith for basic business functionalities. In front of all these services, they created a single gateway that was providing a REST API to all the devices they were supporting. In this way, all the devices could consume the functionality and data they needed, but they had the flexibility to decide how to present it to the user on their own. For obvious reasons, they called that API OSFA which stands for one size fits all. However, this architecture still posed a limitation later on. That API was mainly facilitating the provider, not the consumers. Each of the devices had different characteristics, such as different processing power or memory capacity, thus requiring different data access patterns. However, this API was the same for everyone leading to inefficient and chatty communication a lot of times. So they decided to perform another change. 
They attempted to allow the device teams to perform customizations without compromising the overall system manageability. To achieve that, they tried to separate the content gathering from the content formatting part. To do that, they maintained the existing API, but they created custom endpoints that the devices could use. These endpoints could leverage the existing endpoints, but since everything would live in the same process now, all the performance concerns would go away. On the practical side, this meant that the device teams would develop a set of groovy scripts that would be responsible for receiving the request from the device and expanding it into the appropriate requests to the generic API, executing them in parallel and performing the appropriate optimizations. At this point, I want you to take a little time to think about this architecture and consider whether there is something wrong going on. Of course, there is a monolith emerging again. This architecture also created several problems. From an operational perspective, a bug in the code of one of the devices could create an outage for all the devices, which is definitely not optimal. Furthermore, scaling was difficult because the code for all the devices was deployed in a single unit and vertical scaling was reaching its limitations. Last, but still very important, developer productivity was impacted because the engineers were unable to test their changes locally and had to deploy the script in a test environment and test there. So they iterated one more time on the architecture. What they did is that they split the customized endpoints for each device on separate systems. The code was developed in JavaScript using Node.js and executed in a dockerized environment, which is a container technology. As a result of this, developers could deploy the application locally using Docker and test their changes very easily. Also, they achieved the isolation they wanted between different devices. There is one big takeaway from this example. You might need to go through multiple evolutionary steps in your architecture, depending on the needs you have at each stage. This is not bad at all, since each stage will provide you with data and information that will help you avoid mistakes and make the right decisions, instead of looking for an ideal solution in a single step. When Netflix started scaling their operations, they had a tough realization. Distributed systems can fail in many different ways. The microservices architecture focuses on innovation and allowing teams to deliver faster. However, this makes it harder to think about how these changes affect your system's reliability. As a result, they've created a set of principles that help them evaluate their production systems through experiments and make sure they can handle failures reliably. They've also written a whole book about this, which I urge you to read. Here, we won't go deep in all the principles and their bases, but instead we will describe some of the basic techniques Netflix used to make their systems more reliable and highly available. The Simian Army is a set of tools Netflix developed and open sourced, which can be used to increase the resiliency of your services. The most widely used one is the Chaos Monkey, which allows one to introduce random failures in a system and see how it reacts. What Netflix has been doing, for instance, is that they are killing randomly servers from their production fleets every once in a while and make sure that there was no difference at all in the customer experience because the system was able to handle these failures gracefully. There are many more attacks that can be performed by Chaos Monkey though, such as introducing network latency. Usually, these experiments are performed during business hours so that engineers are in the office and can handle any potential incident that might be caused. Netflix invested the efforts to make these experiments as non-intrusive as possible to the customer experience. As a result, they built TAP, which stands for Chaos Automation Platform, which helps them achieve this goal using several techniques. One problem with their initial approach is that they've been using their production environments to conduct their experiments. This posed the following problem. 
If they used a small percentage of the fleet to experiment, their sample might be quite small to be representative. On the other hand, if they used a larger percentage, they risked creating an incident that would affect a big number of customers. Also, under their existing infrastructure, metrics for both populations were emitted in a single place because they were grouped per environment. That made it harder to compare the behavior of the two populations. This tool allowed them to solve this problem via the following way. The platform was creating new pools of servers for two groups, the control group and the treatment group. Some of the production traffic was diverted to these pools, which were emitting metrics in different locations. As a result, it was easy to compare the two populations, which were of the same size easily. This platform also allowed them to integrate new experiments with their CICD platform so that the experiments would be repeated automatically on every deployment, thus preventing regressions. However, these were mainly approaches for verifying that the systems were able to cope with failures. Before running these experiments, the systems needed to also have processes in place that would help them deal with failures. Netflix has gone to great lengths to ensure reliability. A very good example is the fact that they have processes in place that help them survive when a whole AWS region fails by diverting traffic to the other regions. They've also built a monitoring tool that allows them to easily track this process, since it's quite critical. It's called Flux and we will have a look at it now. As you can see, there is one circle for each region, and the central circle represents the Internet. As the traffic comes from the Internet, it's distributed to the three regions. The small dots represent the requests, while red dots represent errors. In this experiment, the team has introduced failures in the upper left region, and you can see the errors gradually increasing. Around the 20th second of this video, the engineers decide to initiate a region failover, diverting traffic from the upper left region to the upper right region. They increase the percentage of this traffic gradually while they are also scaling up the upper right region accordingly so that it's able to handle the increased traffic. At some point, all the traffic has been redirected. The engineers now take their time to fix the failed region and revert the traffic back. We've already seen that monitoring in a microservices architecture is a highly complex task, since we have to inspect data at various granularities. The SRE teams at Netflix had built a lot of tools to support all these different granularities. In fact, they use the concept of a microscope to illustrate that concept, where we have some data, we can look at it using different magnifying lengths. We'll have a quick look at some of the tools they've built to get an appreciation of their value. At the largest granularity, they are looking at the percentage of traffic exchanged between services overall. By clicking on a specific service, they are also able to dive deeper and look at the traffic of their upstreams and downstreams with more details. They're also collecting many different system metrics around the performance of their services and they've built a tool called Mongool, which is capable of querying overall these metrics, identifying the ones that present some form of correlation and presenting them to the user. In this example, a service at the top is having increased latency, and the system has already provided the engineer with metrics that had spikes during the same period and might be the cause of this issue. Last but not least, they've built a tool that presents the metrics of specific servers. So if an incident is caused by a specific server, the engineers can use that view to identify what's wrong with that server more easily. There is one main requirement to achieve all that as you grow your microservices architecture. You must establish a common set of rules and libraries that all the teams use for the services in a consistent way. Of course, Netflix had a very long path in their transition to a microservices architecture, and they have learned a lot of lessons along the way, which they've been sharing openly.
if we look here at some of the most important ones. Feel free to watch the reference presentation for a more detailed discussion. The first lesson they've learned that actually triggered their migration to a microservices architecture is the fact that vertical scaling is hard and it's easier and cheaper to scale systems horizontally. In order to make your systems resilient to failure, you'll have to introduce redundancy and isolating the failures between different components. This will help you avoid cascading failures, preventing one component from bringing all your systems down. A core methodology Netflix developed is categorizing their services to critical and non-critical services. Doing that, they could focus their effort on increasing the reliability of critical services, allowing the non-critical ones to fail fast and avoid impacting the rest of the system. As you've seen so far, you'll need to make a lot of decisions in this journey, so establishing a set of priorities can help you in this. Netflix has three overarching priorities that have driven the revolution. The first and foremost priority for them is innovation, with reliability coming second, and then efficiency. This order has been given on purpose since they have agreed to compromise on reliability when necessary in order to innovate more and move faster. Moving to a microservices architecture is an organizational change as much as a technological change. Organizational changes are hard, so it's better to perform them gradually. For instance, in the early days, Netflix had centralized some decision-making on some teams, such as database administrators that were responsible for making decisions about changes in databases. As part of their journey to a microservices architecture, Netflix gradually decentralized these decisions, allowing teams to decide about these things, such as the data storage technology they will use. However, they still had some of these people forming platform teams that could act as advisors, providing to teams and building useful tooling. Another lesson that they learned is that migrations between systems don't happen overnight, and they involve a lot of complexity, such as maintaining two different stacks, performing data replication between two systems in both directions, etc. So keep that in mind when performing a migration and invest the right amount of time in planning and design. These are links to some of the references used in this part. Feel free to spend some time to study them in more depth on your own. In this video, we explore the journey of Netflix to a microservices architecture. 